Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Jax Live. I'm your host, Natalie Herlin of the Jackson Laboratory. I'm a product manager in InVivo Services. And joining me here today, I have Rick Huntress, the Director of Business Development and Commercial Strategy. Welcome, Rick. Good morning. Good morning, Natalie. Rick's worked closely with our drug development partners since the initial development of our Humanized Mouse program here at Jax. And he's going to be talking with us today about working with these highly specialized models. So as a reminder to our audience, Please be sure to use the comment box if you're watching on YouTube or LinkedIn. You could submit a question to us, add a comment, or send us a shout out. We love to hear where you're watching from. So give us a hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We'll try to answer as many of your questions as we can during our broadcast today at the end. So please, like I said, feel free to enter your comments during the broadcast. All right, right. CD34 and Grafman, let's talk about that. So this, these are cord blood cells that we're using to humanize mice. And this is a pretty complicated and time consuming process. And there's providers like Jax that offer off the shelf mice. And with that in mind, why would anyone bother to do this in house in their own program? And I'm particularly curious what your clients in different industries based on their size or application have told you as common reasons why they're choosing to do their own humanization programs. Sure, that's a great question, Natalie, and it does vary a little bit based on um, what the customer's trying to, what the, the lab or the group is trying to accomplish. Um, the technology was pioneered in individual labs uh, like the, uh, Lenny Schultz at the Jackson Laboratory. Um, and as the utility of the tool became uh, more relevant to drug discovery, um, those labs were not able to, to meet the demand, uh, particularly in the, in the drug screening setting. Um, and so as it moved out of those, those individual labs, really it, it, it falls into two buckets why clients mm -hmm. often try to insource the technology into their own organizations. And the first is uh, pharmacology groups at large pharma or biotechs. Um, these groups have invested in infrastructure, staff, and expertise. And really what they're trying to do is, is because they're not inexpensive mice, they're, they're doing this in-house in an attempt to reduce cost is the primary okay. reason they might do that. Um, the other reason uh, that companies would do this is because they're doing gene therapy, uh, which is very different. So you have pharmacology groups that might be screening drugs uh, for immuno-oncology, in the gene therapy space, they're looking at bone marrow related genetic diseases like sickle cell anemia, for example. So they're doing it in house because they can't use the off the shelf engrafted mice. They have to do modification before the engraftment. Okay, so what I've heard two very different scenarios from me here. I've heard a large organization where they're producing mice at scale and it's really cost driven to produce their own mice as opposed to purchase them, right? Yeah. And then the yep. other one, maybe there's a limitation in the technology where the cells that you want to implant um, kind of necessitate doing that humanization in-house. An off-the-shelf product isn't going to meet the need because you have some custom cells that you want to use. Is that right? Exactly. Yep. Those are very different reasons. And, you know, both of these don't get away from the fact that it's a, a very labor-intensive process to make these mice. And I'm wondering, given the complexity and everything you know, and we know here at Jax about p creating one of these humanized mice, uh, does it really end up being cost effective? And are there any challenges that um, you might not think about when you're starting to lay out a program and add up those costs? Uh, the, the short answer is um, it depends. Of course. Um, yeah. and, and, and the key there, yeah, the key is to do the kind of review that, that provides a real accounting of costs. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the, the first, in, in having these conversations with clients and, and users, the, the first thing that, that comes up is they often confuse the cost of producing a humanized mouse with the cost of getting a humanized mouse on study. Okay. And, and the other part of it is sometimes they don't include the indirect expenses in, in their own analysis. So as a, for example, you might start, a, lab, a group might start with 3 million uh, hematopoietic stem cells, they engraft 30 mice, and, and they develop a cost for that. But that doesn't mean that all 30 of those mice are gonna get on study. And 
anyone who's working in a preclinical in vivo environment understands the concept of overage. Um, but in order to have an accurate overage, you need to understand what the attrition rates are at the various steps as you go through. So mm -hmm. what percentage of mice survive my myeloablation and then engraftment? What percentage of, of either mice or donors uh, deliver the right level of engraftment? And then how long do those mice live out um, before you, you need to enroll them on study? And like any complicated technique, that's going to vary at the site. So you can you can range set yourself with the published literature sometimes, but you've got to establish those norms. And, and if your, your assumptions aren't correct, you've got to go back and, and make the adjustments. Right. Um, and then in terms of the indirect cost, you know, the simple thing I'm referring to here is often um, FTEs, the cost of staff. A lot of times for a pharmacology group, salaries and those kinds of items are in a separate budget. And since it's not a direct department budget, they don't include it in their cost. So it might be the department's cost for producing a mouse is, is less than a commercially available source, but the cost of the organization um, might be higher. And frankly, those folks could be running studies instead of engrafting mice. So it, it really comes down to uh, how you approach your cost analysis. So it's not just as simple as I want 30 mice on a study. What what are the cost of materials for producing those 30 mice? There's a lot more to keep in mind related to the right. process and the people and the resources needed. Um, I see that we have some people joining us today from Washington State, Texas, uh, some others from Massachusetts, where you are, Rick, Maine, California, where I am, New York, Belgium, and even Iran. Thank you for joining us here today, and thanks for saying hello. So we've been talking about some of the uh, challenges with producing humanized mice at scale within your own facility. And we've had the discussion that a lot of this is driven by cost, that there's lots of different factors that come into play when you are calculating that cost. But is cost the only challenge? Are there any other factors consider to consider when you're making your own mice at scale in-house? Or what are some of the top ones, maybe, is a better way to ask that. You know, the next one that's very high up on the list is forecasting your demand or your need. Okay. Um, in, in a typical immuno-oncology study, these animals take 12 to 16 weeks before the engraft, the hematopoiesis is at a level where you can engraft your tumors and run your studies. So you've got to plan your experiments out four to five months in advance, at least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've worked with enough dynamic biotech companies and, and some fast moving pharmas that um, oftentimes uh, programs change direction, studies have new requirements. And again, going back to how many are you producing the overage, what, you, what ends up happening is the, this production timeline ends up driving the, the decisions that get made instead of the other way around. And so trying to predict uh, how many mice you're going to need, or let's say you get a bad donor, you get one bad donor and you have to start the whole process mm -hmm. all over again. So um, the cost, but also the resource planning and making sure you have what you need when, when your, your discovery scientists are ready to uh, provide you compounds to test. Yeah. So there's that, that lead time. That's another challenge really with making your own production. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for pointing that. So let's switch gears because you talk, we've talked a lot about uh, large scale production at, at a big organization by a pharmacology group. You also mentioned that another common uh, group that might be making humanized mouse, mice in-house are companies developing gene therapies. And their need for doing this is because they want to implant their own cells into the mice. And that's how they want to humanize them. Right. So do they face similar challenges or, or is it a different story there? Well, obviously, from a cost perspective and planning, they have the same challenge. But actually, um, in talking with gene therapy groups, there are other things that play into how they need to think about it. They don't have the option to use off-the-shelf and grafted mice, so mm -hmm. it, it, mm -hmm. they're going to have to go in. Um, in here, it, it it's a little bit more about the the development and approval process for these gene therapies. Oftentimes, what we see is that clients are doing gene modification in vitro, and then they're transferring fresh cells into the mice. They're doing the engraftment with fresh cells, right. which works fine in, a, in an environment where you're testing different vectors, testing different doses. But when you reach a point where you, start, you need to start generating data for compliance purposes, 
Um, and first of all, this is not an efficacy system. Here, you're not you're not curing a disease in the mouse. You're really this really is quality control, quality assurance on around the vectors. Okay. Okay. When you then have to present uh, both dose and safety data, that's often generated in a third party laboratory. It might be in a uh, a, a more regulated setting, and you have to transfer your cells. And if they haven't implemented something as a freeze-thaw step into their process, they'll now be in a position where it, it limits their options for, for doing that kind of safety and validation, third-party validation testing. And they have to go back, and we, Jax has seen this because we do this kind of safety testing. They have to go back, introduce the freeze-thaw step into their process and repeat some of the original validations because whenever you thaw cells you get some loss there might be changes in, in engraftment kinetics hematopoiesis and, and other aspects and so they can lose some time if they're not thinking far enough ahead about how to plan for uh, the regulatory aspects of moving their therapy into the clinic so that's that's a completely different challenge that yep. some clients might not anticipate. And I'm grateful that we can talk about this here today and hopefully save some other people headaches in the future with, <laughs> right. with planning ahead for what it might look like in the next stage of your pipeline and being able to, uh, to, to incorporate that when you're doing your preclinical work. So we've talked about a lot of challenges with groups that are doing their own in-house humanization. And I think a really natural place to go to right now are what are the ways that someone like Jax could support these organizations that have their own programs? Sure, and we're, we're doing that today. And, and we've got a number of large pharma groups where Jax acts as an on-demand supplier uh, to support their demand schedule when their needs fluctuate or if they get a bad donor. Um, and COVID-19 has obviously played a role. And, and um, because we never closed, we maintained engraftment, we've actually been able to help a number of our clients continue advancing their, their compounds through uh, discovery and, and validation because they were able to supplement or support their programs with, with animals from JAX. Uh, this hybrid approach works really well. Uh, they can leverage their in-house resources um, if, and, and get the biggest bang for their dollar. But when something dynamic or, or uh, unexpected occurs, they can quickly integrate uh, their backup, which would be JAX in this case, in, into the system. Mm -hmm. The one thing that we always recommend when folks are thinking about this is you want to validate your, your support network before you need it. So we might uh, help them by getting a few cohorts in early. They run them side by side with their in-house, and then we can make adjustments um, to, to align things as needed. So mm -hmm. that works in the in that drug efficacy IO space. Um, for the gene therapy groups, um, it's similar in the sense that by getting engaged with us, oftentimes what they can do is they can introduce that freeze-thaw step, for example, if that's the the uh, hurdle we're trying to get over. They can send their cells to us. JAX can thaw them. That's a true beta test. That's not an internal test. That's using a third party. We can thaw them and graft them. Uh, we can look at hematopoiesis and send the data back, or we can even ship the mice back, ship tissues back, and then they can run it side by side with their in-house and really validate or, or confirm how the change in a step uh, impacted their overall process. And again, we've done both of these things for both of these different groups and continue to do that today. So that first point of providing additional mice for peak demand really gets at that point that it takes four months to make a mouse, right? And so sometimes you need them in a pinch. And if you've already done the work to uh, validate uh, supporting mice with your own mice, then you can add and su supplement your chain on demand there. That point I can really see. And it's great to have a service who can help with the, for the gene therapy companies that can help validate that process, that freeze thaw step of something that you might need to work out for the next stage of your pipeline. Yeah, I'm gonna graphed, oops, oh, I'm oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say nobody grafts more CD34 into NSG mice than the Jackson Laboratory. So we can quickly turn these things around and get folks the data that allows them to make decisions and move forward. So I have a question from the audience, Rick. Um, the okay. viewer asked, for my study, I think that a humanized mouse, a humanized NSG might not be applicable 
And are there additional options for me to use? Yeah, typically this relates to the cell type or the target that uh, okay. somebody's trying to hit. So there are a number of um, NSG transgenic strains, uh, particularly where we're expressing cytokines that might drive hematopoiesis in slightly different pathways so that you get additional cell types uh, that are present. Um, there are also some transgenic strains, for example, that express things like uh, human HLA-2 so mm -hmm. that you can get a a restricted T cell response in one of these systems. So it depends on the question that's being asked. And then we even have some strains that might be a little bit easier to work with in that for those gene therapy groups because they don't require the same kind of preconditioning that um, a normal NSG has. So depending on the question, I think at this point we're somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 or 30 NSG derivative strains or transgenic mm -hmm. strains. So yeah, there are a lot of options. And um, the Jackson Lab, our, our technical information science group, MICE tech group, can help clients understand uh, or users understand what their options are and how we might go about that. And some of those are off the shelf, too. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, we've covered a lot of ground here today. And, you know, my main takeaway is that there are several ways that JAX can support clients with an in-house humanization program. Uh, for example, we talked about supplying additional mice for demand. We've talked about helping clients prepare and execute safety studies. Do you have any parting words for our audience here today, Rick? And who should they contact for more information? Yeah, well, first off, I want to thank everyone for their attention. This is a ton of fun, and I've enjoyed um, having this conversation with you, Natalie. Um, our, I mentioned our technical information science group. It's micetech at jax.org, and they are a great starting point. It's a collection of about a dozen PhD scientists with uh, diverse skill sets and, and expertise, and they can quickly bring the right subject matter experts and the local JAX team uh, mm -hmm. to bear for um, the resources that uh, a group might be looking for. Great, thank you. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time for our live stream today, but this is part two of a three-part series on humanized mice. And Rick, you're going to be back next week, right, for our next edition of Jack's Live. Same bat time, same bat channel, Wednesdays <laughs> at uh, 11.30 a.m. Eastern. And what are we talking about next week? Uh, we're talking about uh, cytokine release syndrome platforms. Uh, okay. We have a platform that uh, has a number of applications both in terms of assessing the potential immunogenicity or risk of large molecule biologics, um, as well as uh, in the COVID environment, potential therapeutics that could uh, mitigate uh, CRS or reduce CRS um, in COVID patients. So it's a, it's a platform that uh, has evolved to support multiple applications. And I'm gonna be talking with Dr. Basil Siwa, who's one of our uh, immunologists and uh, field representatives um, who's been working with clients using that platform in both ways. I look forward to it. That's exciting and very timely. <laughs> yep. Yeah, well, thank you for your time here this morning. Thanks for the great discussion. And thanks to all of you for joining us here today for Jack's Live. And we will be back next week, as I said, 1130 a.m. on Wednesday. And we'll see you then. Have a great day, a great evening, and uh, 